Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. back with episode 34 of the Leo Training Podcast. This week's guest is Brett Jones. Brett is an individual who has had a tremendous impact on me personally and professionally in my young strength and conditioning career, both in the way that I conduct my own personal practice and the way I teach. I own several of Brett's DVDs and manuals and have had the opportunity to learn from him in person twice. Once at an FMS Level 2 workshop and last summer at an Indian Club workshop with fellow Master SFG Phil Scurrito and Dr. Ed Thomas. I highly encourage you to check out some of the articles and products that we will be discussing in this interview. You will be a better instructor and student because of them. Truth be told, the most difficult part of this podcast episode for me has been recording a guest introduction for Brett that I am satisfied with. So let me tell you a little bit more about Brett. Brett began his career in the rehabilitative field and transitioned into the strength and conditioning field. Brett Jones is Strong First Chief SFG Instructor and is an FMS Advisory Board member. He is also a certified athletic trainer and strength and conditioning specialist through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Brett is based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Sports Medicine from High Point University and a Master of Science in Rehabilitative Sciences from Clarion University of Pennsylvania. In this episode, I discuss some of Brett's works such as Kettlebells from the Ground Up 1 and 2, as well as Dynami. We also discuss Plan Strong, how Indian Club Swinging is a great complement to hard style training, and, it, and how it can help restore the body as well as how it could be integrated into your Strong First Level 2 certification training as you prepare for that weekend, especially since you spend most of the time that weekend overhead and you want to keep your shoulders healthy and strong. Finally, just a note to the audience. We had some technical difficulties at the beginning of the interview, and I had to splice together two separate audio files, so there was a bit of a break in the flow of conversation early on. Just something for you to be aware of. Without further ado, let's roll to episode 34 of the Leo Training Podcast. I am very excited, pleased, and honored uh, to have on a very special guest uh, this morning, uh, someone that I have uh, followed uh, a lot of their material, uh, continue to be a student, and have had the the pleasure of uh, being to some some workshops that they've led in person. Um, I'm welcoming Brett Jones, Chief SFG, Master SFG of Strong First and Advisory Board Member to Functional Movement Systems. Brett, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Uh, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. Uh, Joe, it's great to be on with you, and I look forward to uh, to answering the questions and, and uh, chatting here for a while. Me too. I'm, uh, I'm very excited and honored to have you on. So thank you again for taking the time to, to do so. I know you're very, very busy and you just, uh, came off of the, the strong first leadership and plan strong, uh, week, weekend or week, I guess it would be. It was, it was a full week. We had some FMS meetings here in Pittsburgh and then, uh, basically from Sunday to Sunday, I was, uh, in meetings and very busy. So, uh, trying to get my feet back underneath of me, clear that email inbox and uh, get, uh, get, get back to square. So uh, uh, always fun. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so why don't we kick things off uh, before we get into the topics? Um, I'm very familiar with who you are. I have a pretty diverse audience between the, the strength and conditioning and endurance communities. So if you could just kind of uh, tell a little bit more about yourself um, in terms of your background um, so people can get a, a little bit of a better feel for uh, your experience and, and the type of um, you know clients or athletes that, that you work with, um, and then we'll we'll kind of launch into the, the topics. Sure, I'll uh, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, basically, started out with a bachelor's in athletic training, uh, so NATA certified uh, ATC, 
Uh, got a master's in rehabilitative sciences uh, as a grad assistant athletic trainer. <clears throat> Actually took my first job down in Chatham, Virginia, uh, Hargrave Military Academy, which just happens to be Greg Cook's hometown. So uh, he walked into my training room one day and wanted to know if I needed any help. So I worked directly with Gray uh, from 95 to 97, both in my training room and his clinics uh, down there in, in the Chatham and Danville, Virginia area. And then I moved back up to Pennsylvania, ran a hospital fitness center for five years. And um, during that time, went to the second ever uh, workshop that Pavel taught in the U.S. on kettlebells. And then a year later, in um, April of 2003, I started uh, traveling and teaching uh, with Pavel. So I've been teaching with Pavel for 13 years, and that led to me putting out a kettlebell DVD, which led to Gray Cook getting back in touch with me, which led to uh, me working with Gray on some videos and the development of the FMS Level 2 materials. And, um, and then it's just been... A crazy ride uh, since then, traveling the world, teaching, uh, working within uh, Pavel's group, now Strong First, uh, and uh, with Gray and FMS, Lee Burton and uh, the, the gang there to uh, progress uh, that as well. So it's been uh, been a great uh, been a great run. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. So you have a, a really. Uh, diverse, you know, experience background, both on the strength and conditioning and then coming from that, that athletic training background. So, um, you can really look at, uh, the way individuals move, um, and, and provide a, a really unique perspective in terms of both the, the performance and rehabilitative side, um, that, that, uh, more and more individuals are, are trying to, to look at, which is really cool. It- it has been, uh, you know, starting as an athletic trainer and being very classically trained in orthopedic evaluation, rehabilitation, uh, and then transitioning into working with gray and, and understanding movement patterns. And, you know, that's been a great transition, uh, being a personal trainer and, and, uh, working the hospital fitness center I ran. We had people of all, uh, neurological conditions, Parkinson's, strokes. Uh, from orthopedic issues, joint replacements to amputees to wheelchair bound to, uh, just senior citizens looking to get fit to high school athletes looking to get fit. And, you know, so, and I've maintained a, a personal training and online training business, um, all that time. And, uh, so a lot of different, a lot of different folks. And, uh, I will say that, uh, athletic training gave me a, a really good foundation uh, for moving into the fitness industry and being able to uh, work with people effectively. Awesome. Awesome. So cool. Um, so let's kick things off. Let's talk about your personal journey into kettlebells. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I believe I, I caught this in one of the, the secrets DVDs. You, you mentioned uh, briefly that um, you had sustained a, a back injury and one of the, the tools that you used to help you in your rehabilitation uh, was the kettlebell. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to bring up this topic is <clears throat> I know for me working with, with clients, when I sort of tell them the, the different tools and equipment that I use to, to help them train, I, I sometimes get the, um, you know, the initial cringe when, when they hear the word kettlebell. Um, so I, I think it's really important for uh, the wide audience to know that they have uh, a, a really strong rehabilitative, uh, almost therapeutic component to them, as well as the performance side. And I think it'd be great for you to kind of share your story, if you wouldn't mind, because um, I want people to know that they can, they can be very effective in, in that realm as well. Sure. So um, it's a little bit of a, well, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, I had gotten Pavel's Power to the People um, in the late 90s, uh, right around 2000. I, I forget when exactly he, he put that book out, but I had gotten that and um, had been doing a little Power to the People. And the marketing machine kicked in and I started hearing about kettlebells, kettlebells, kettlebells. And so um, I had ordered the original RKC book. And... Uh, I actually, I leafed through it and I put it in a drawer, uh, for like three months. I didn't even, I didn't start. Like I looked at it and I was like, eh, I don't, don't know what to do with this. And so I put it in the drawer and then got it back out and, uh, hooked up a, a dumbbell, 50 pounds, um, and tried some, 
snatches uh, in one of the protocols that he recommended in the in the original book. And uh, when EMS was done uh, reviving me, I uh, decided that uh, I should get some education and training in this. Uh, for those of you not familiar with my sense of humor, that was a joke. Uh, I did not. I felt like I had a near death experience. I did not have one. Um, but it was a, it was an intense, it was a very eye opening experience to hook up that dumbbell, try the snatches and go, wow, I, I really need to know more about this. And so that led to me attending the February 02, um, RKC at that time, uh, Pavel's second ever, uh, kettlebell workshop. And, um, and then actually I won the TSC that October and then, Ended up uh, being invited to be a at that time senior instructor uh, for Pavel in um, in April of '03. Now around that time in '03, so for those people that may feel that for whatever reason um, I'm like I don't know the the only thing that comes to mind is William Wallace. He can't be William Wallace. William Wallace is seven foot tall. <laughs> um, uh, I I'm just as um, just as able to experience the ups and downs of, uh, of a physical life as anybody and uh, um, had hurt my back in high school uh, wrestling and then uh, squatting in 03. I, uh, I, I dinged my back uh, pretty, pretty well, which resulted in an L5 S1 laminectomy in September of 03. And uh, yeah, one of the pools I was already, I had been using kettlebells um, and I was actually, yeah, due to a bad uh, back squat attempt in in O three, I ended up with a uh, uh, L five S one laminectomy. Uh, a minute ago, it was um, a high school injury that ended up getting kind of finished off during this uh, this bad uh, back squat attempt. And so, you know, when McGill says uh, it's a bad idea if your spine changes position under load, I can vouch for that. Um, I have very personal experience with that. You know, the back squat uh, led to back squat injury, uh, L5S1 laminectomy led to um, me you know, having a, a, it was a funny conversation with the surgeon after, afterwards, uh, asking him for his advice and, you know, how to, how to proceed. And uh, basically it was uh, four weeks of uh, walk, don't bend forward, don't be stupid, um, which was pretty much the... So I did that for four weeks and then saw him again. He's like, you can start in some light body weight stuff. So I did. And then four weeks after that, he's like, you can, you know, you can start going back into some of your other activities. So I just started with a 16 kilo bell and, uh, started back with, uh, basics, uh, get ups, and, uh, deadlifts into swings and presses and things of that nature, but just nice and light. And, uh, was able to, uh, um, that was, that was late in 03, Fast forward to 06, 07, um, I power lifting and, uh, had a, hit a all time best at a AAU, uh, national meet, uh, down in Florida, um, but 198 raw, um, 518 back squat, 573 deadlift, um, beast, beast tamer, um, 10th guy in the world to bend the red nail. So, and other, other grip stuff. So, um, things certainly progressed very, very well, uh, from, from that point forward. So, um, I, I like, I like people knowing that because some people feel like a back injury or in particular a back surgery can be like this, almost like a death sentence sort of thing where it's, it just ends, uh, your, your career, uh, physically. And it's just not the case. Um, I, I accomplished my best stuff uh, post back surgery. That's awesome. Uh, so thank you very much for, for sharing that. I think that is, again, like you just said, very important for, um, the, the lay person and the general public to know, um, and that the, the kettlebell can be a, a very useful tool in both the, uh, rehabilitative spectrum as well as the performance spectrum. Absolutely. I mean, I've found it to be, a um, and, and various times, so, uh, not to get too long or detailed into it, but I've had like seven different surgeries, uh, over my lifespan. Uh, one of them exercise related. Um, all the others were, um, a knee surgery back in 96, uh, which was from wrestling in high school and a left inguinal hernia and an appendectomy. And then because of the appendectomy, I had a ventral hernia repair and I had the back surgery and you know, just, just various stuff like that. I mean, I've had, uh, I've 
had a, a, several things go on in my lifetime. And uh, from 02 on, the kettlebell has been a go-to tool for me um, whenever I run into one of those situations and I have to kind of get back on my feet. It's it's uh, really the go to thing uh, that I look to to use. Awesome, awesome. Uh, thank you, Brett. Yep. So, um, segueing into our next topic, um, one of the uh, products that you have put out uh, and that I own highly recommend and encourage uh, any kettlebell instructor or those interested in beginning with kettlebells this is a great, uh, entry, entry point, uh, kettlebells from the ground, ground up, uh, the calisthenics. Um, so in that, uh, DVD and manual, um, you gray and Dr. Mark Chang, uh, cover, uh, the Turkish get up. Mm-hmm. Um, so three important concepts that are discussed, uh, early on are, uh, one is working on any limitations or deficiencies between the left and right side, uh, when executing a get up. Um, so one, why, why is that important? Um, and how can the, the get up kind of, uh, reveal some of those deficiencies? Uh, so right, left differences, um, we've, we've known since the, the early nineties that, uh, differences in, in, in movement, uh, right to left can have an impact as far as, uh, you know, the, uh, injury profiles and things of that nature and injury risk. Um, and from a, from a strength, uh, standpoint, just being able to, um, uh, have somewhat equal strength, you know, there's always going to be a right left difference. Um, that's, that's part of how we function as, as people. Uh, but when that difference grows beyond 10 to 15%, uh, we start to run into some areas where, um, we probably need to look at that. And since, the uh, get up gives an appreciation of um, uh, big quotation marks around core uh, control, um, how it integrates with the shoulder, moving through a tremendous uh, range of uh, range of motion, and then uh, coming up into the lunge, back down. Uh, there's just a, there's so much going on in the get up. When one of those transitions positions uh, act, um, actions within the get up is vastly different from right to left. Um, that's something that, it, that I get interested in taking a look at. Now, for me and my clients, I've already FMSed them typically. Um, I kind of have an idea of what's going on with their movement and, and what direction I need to uh, take that. So um, definitely uh, looking at that left, right side, if it's easy breezy uh, through, through the positions and transitions on one side and you really feel like you're struggling on the other side or you simply can't use the same amount of uh, weight on the other side, that's probably something to uh, take a good look at. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so one of the, the other uh, concepts in uh, the calisthenics is uh, the, the four knots. Mm-hmm. Um, so one is, the first part of that is, what, what are the four knots and why is it important to create to aim to create a perfect balance of flexibility and strength in the four knots. So uh, the four knots uh, was something I learned about from uh, Dr. Mark Chang, uh, one of our uh, senior instructors and a a Chinese medicine uh, specialist. And that's a concept that comes from Eastern medicine that says um, the, the shoulders and the hips are these interrelated things, uh, these knots and when you pull tighter on one, you pull tighter on the, the usually the opposite other uh, knot. So a restriction in your hip can cause a problem with your shoulder, problem with your shoulder can cause an issue in your hip. And so balancing those things out so that everyone's uh, talking nicely together, playing nicely together, uh, can be really important. And that's actually one of the ways that I use uh, the Bretzel now is if I can get somebody doing a basic rib grab T-spine rotation and they look like they have really good rotation in that um, exercise, in that, in, that, in that drill, then I'll bring them back to sideline and throw in the bottom leg uh, quad. And there's times where it steals over half of their T-spine rotation. So the T-spine rotation looks great. Uh, when the quad uh, opposite hip is not involved, anterior chain, um, 
I'm trying to quit naming muscles because it just causes problems. Um, so when the anterior chain of the opposite hip is involved, um, that tends to, uh, they, they can lose uh, half or most of their T-spine rotation. So then getting that uh, quadrant uh, right-left uh, area to, to play nicely together uh, really, um, um, really works well. Awesome. Um, so if they, if, if an individual is having some issues, um, and there's, you know, clearly like say there's just a, a huge difference in the range of motion or mobility, um, between one side, you know, if you're executing a pretzel as like maybe per, per, uh, part of a movement prep before you're getting into the getup, that's something that they're going to, they're want to want to address long term. Absolutely. And, and a lot of people, um, I just, I, I see a lot of mistakes when people get into position for the pretzel, um, and, and things of that nature. So I, um, I, I prefer to see, um, a good rib grab first, uh, progressing into a pretzel, always start in pure sideline. Uh, don't start rotated. Um, make sure that top leg, that knee comes up above 90 degrees so that you're really, um, holding things in position as well as you can. Uh, one of the things that my, uh, that my back, uh, does not like, uh, from a movement perspective, lower back is rotation. Um, I've had a couple of situations where either a yoga class or a, it was a Thai massage one time, uh, where they snuck up on me kind of, and gave me a rotation and that never goes over well, uh, for my back, but I can rib grab bretzel and do T-spine rotation all day. Uh, because I know how to prevent as much motion as possible from that area. Um, so, yes, yeah, as, as people you know progress into their training, um, you know, making sure uh, T-spine, hips, and ankles do what they're supposed to is uh, some really good key areas. For sure, for sure. Um, third part in dealing with the, the four knots. So this is another uh, very subtle but I think powerful uh, point made made in the manual um, for calisthenics. Uh, why poor breathing patterns can exacerbate neck centered movement rather than core centered movements, and how can um, a neck centered movement and the breath uh, carry over, or how does it carry over into hard style kettlebell training? So when you get into what we would call an apical breathing pattern where we tend to breathe shallow and up, so we get some of the accessory muscles uh, that kind of become a little more involved in our breathing than, than they should. Um, we take about 14,000 breaths a day. So if that's 14,000 reps for all of those accessory muscles and we start breathing shallow and up, uh, that can can create uh, some some fairly significant issues uh, with with movement um, causes a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, getting the diaphragm involved in your breathing is uh, is one of the keys to because the diaphragm is such an important muscle. It does so many things within the body, and uh, you know the diaphragm functions from the standpoint of um, so called core stability, postural control, but also breathing. And if you if your body's going to rate those, it will choose breathing uh, every day, and uh, so it, uh, it it'll get kind of kicked out of some other other areas. And then breathing in general is important so much because it functions uh, from a biochemical perspective, from a neurological perspective, um, and then the mechanical perspective that uh, that we just talked about. So there's there's a ton going on as far as the just breathing in general is concerned. And as you, you perform these, uh, if you're with this apical breathing pattern with the accessory muscles involved, uh, as you continue to breathe in that up uh, sort of style, muscles become very active in most everything that we do. And then you get um, a variety of things can, can flow off of that. So we become a little disengaged in the middle, a little over-engaged. Uh, in the neck, and uh, that that certainly can impact uh, how we're moving and performing. Good diaphragmatic breath allows us to have great intra-abdominal pressure. So when we Pavel calls it breathing behind the shield, and uh, and and using you know McGill's concept of bracing and and producing this intra-abdominal pressure, 
Um, and then, you know, there's two different breathing styles. There's a, there's a, uh, anatomical breathing match where when we get compressed, air gets forced out. When we expand, air gets drawn in versus the biomechanical breathing match, which is the opposite. When we're getting compressed, we actually breathe in and produce that bubble of stability as we, um, uh, and then we exhale on this, on this extension. So just two different breathing matches, um, for, Within strong first and and all of the things that we that we teach, um, relaxation and flexibility are facilitated with more of the anatomical breathing match. Power, strength, uh, stability, stabilizing the the center uh, is more facilitated with a biomechanical breathing match, which is essential to have the diaphragm involved there. So that those breathing styles and techniques come with us uh, through all of our schools uh, strong. First body weight, strong first lifter, kettlebell, uh, things of that nature. Is it, that's a, a certainly a con- continuous theme uh, through our uh, schools. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I I, I love uh, that I pulled from from that uh, the manual and the DVD because because the getup is purposefully supposed to be done so slow. You can really um, kind of pick different areas to focus on, and sometimes just really focusing on the, the breath and in the transitions as you, as you said earlier, that can, it's amazing how much, um, that can change the, the, the whole getup. You know? Absolutely. It's, uh, the, the getup is a, it's a mini splendored thing. Uh, <laughs> it can be a tremendous way to, uh, build, um, some really unique, uh, strength through a lot of different ranges, a lot of different positions. Um, you know, when, when we, when we first put out, um, Kayla Stenos, people became, um, a little obsessed with finding the quote, perfect get up and forgot, uh, that he, um, f- forgot that they should be also be, um, building great strength with this. So it's, this is an exercise that can do several different things for us and we can use it as a way to, um, it's how I finish my movement prep when I train. Uh, I go into a couple of get-ups just to make sure everything feels like it's clicking on all cylinders on both sides, and that kind of leads me in the direction of heading into my my main workout. And then, um, or it can be the, my lift or focus for the day, where I'm trying to build some some strength uh, or endurance. So there's there's a lot going on, and and the as you alluded, the, the smoothness of the transitions, the control through all of these different postures and positions, um, some, some really nice carryover. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely, uh, it, it's, it's probably my favorite. It's, it's just, there's so much there. And, uh, I think it's one of those things that the longer you do it, you, you just continue to refine it and refine it. And, uh, you know, you, you are working on, uh, all those little nuances that we, that we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, we're all on this, uh, on this ramp, this progression ramp towards this mythical mastering a skill. And, um, we want to move on that ramp at whatever pace is appropriate for us. Um, but again, remembering that the, the, the perfection that that mythical mastering of a skill is hanging out there. It'll always be hanging out there for us, and we can use this to build great strength. Um, it can take a prominent role in our in our training from time to time. It can take a back seat from time to time, where you're just doing it enough to to maintain the skill and make sure you're ready for your other training. So, uh, just a lot of different ways to um, to use that there. Absolutely. Um, so this is a great segue into our next topic. Um, so another, uh, manual and DVD that, that you put out, uh, was Dynami. And one of the, the central themes and concepts in Dynami is, uh, patterning s- slow strength and symmetry to form the dynamic foundation for integrated power. Um, so before we get to the main part of that question, why is it important <laughs> to pattern slow strength and symmetry to form that dynamic foundation for power? So uh, th- there's been a mindset in the, in the training world for a while now that if you move slow, you'll be slow. And um, that's I just kind of wholly disagree with that. I, I think speed is the last variable that we add to a situation. And 
if uh, speed is usually how we love hiding things. So the analogy I always give is if, if it's a certain size pothole um, you or bump in the road, you, you f- actually feel it less if you're going fast enough. If you're going slow, you actually feel the car dip into the, into the hole. Um, obviously, once a pothole gets so big, you're going to feel it no matter <laughs> what speed you're going. Um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, this, this certain size pothole that uh, you can avoid uh, if you're going fast enough because you just kind of glide right over. Um, we do that within our movement, within our strength, within our exercises. Uh, we, um, we, we have a hard time challenging ourselves within those, uh, situations where, um, there, there is a, a weak link or something that we need to improve. Um, and that's, you know, it's not fun. It's not fun to work on these weak links and these things that we need to improve. Uh, but working on any link in the chain, except the weakest link won't change the chain. So, um, I usually find that by uh, stepping back, uh, looking, uh, we'll just use the swing as an example. Uh, I rarely find a person that comes to me for a session that I cannot improve their swing by going back to their deadlift, back to their kettlebell deadlift, and making sure that they've got this this patterned slow strength hip hinge um, dialed in. And so it's just a way to make sure we're not missing um, or compensating for some uh, potholes in our uh, movement. Yes. I love, I love that analogy. That's great. Um, so one of the things that I, I thought was just brilliant in the way that it was laid out in the, in the manual, the, the progressions, I love, um, how you are checking as you learn the skills, you know, you're going from, um, for example, patterning the deadlift to, to move to the swing. But before you even get to the swing, you're, learning the deadlift, just the pattern with, with a dowel rod, and then you're going with a single bell and then uh, a double kettlebell deadlift, one, one in each hand, and then moving towards a single leg deadlift. And then it, it's sort of the same thing. So as we're moving towards learning this movement, we're also um, working on that, that coordination and, and symmetry uh, but it's also, it can be very humbling because we're kind of exposing all those things that you just talked about. Um, so why, why is it, there's a ton of value, I think, in going back and just spending time doing a lot of the unilateral movements. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, w- what would be some of the benefits even for SFG instructors to go back and just spend some time doing, you know, single leg deadlifts or, um, uh, a, a single arm, uh, a uh, single kettlebell deadlift. All of that stuff, um, just making sure that uh, it's, and so being very much an FMS guy, um, you know, when we, the top three patterns, when we look at the, the squat, the, the lunge, and the, and the hurdle step, um, we're looking at three different foot positions. We can be really good in symmetrical stance, not so hot in single leg stance, and be really good again in, in this asymmetrical stance. So, Working through uh, things like a symmetrical stance deadlift to a s- single arm uh, symmetrical stance deadlift to a single leg deadlift gives us an opportunity to start looking at those different foot positions. How, do, how does my hip slash body function when I change my base of support? Um, so just kind of there's some buffer zone and, and uh, things that are built in there that let me see. You know, if I'm rock star steady for 10 single leg deadlifts on my right leg, but I'm at four on my left leg, um, I'm going to argue that potentially in your symmetrical stance deadlift, you could be uh, 60-40 uh, in your power production right to left. And that may be having an impact on how the swing is going to affect you. Uh, so just I, f- I find... Um, the, the value in, in keeping all of that stuff and, and uh, a check on right left uh, sort of uh, symmetry and not even from a movement perspective, a strength perspective, uh, a coordination perspective. I mean, there, there's, there's so many ways to, to look at right left um, coordination and, and uh, the different foot positions and stances. So, um, so yeah, work, working through those can be a, an essential part of uh, getting somebody kind of balanced out and, um, and balanced out, big quotation marks, right? That's right. Uh, that's um, the goal is to swing kettlebell. 
So um, there, that we want to keep that as the thing we're we're moving towards. The sequence you laid out of working on a deadlift to a two kettlebell deadlift to a single arm symmetrical stance deadlift to ten minutes for some of my clients, they're they're ready. Like it, it doesn't present a challenge to them. Um, or I find a significant bottleneck for a client and that, uh, helps us to move safely, uh, into the swing. So my goal is always to get people swinging or doing the exercises that are appropriate for them. Um, but I, I just want to set a little bit of a baseline and foundation for what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it's something that I continually come back to, um, you know, working a lot with, with endurance athletes, whether it's rowers or, um, you know, I work with some golfers or or even runners, um, you know, you're running, you're spending a ton of time. Well, we all walk around, but single leg stance, but the, uh, athletes like golfers or rowers who have a rotational component to it, there is a huge amount of their time outside of working with, with myself or you that they're, they're really, um, moving their body, uh, to one side. So they're becoming very dominant in that type of movement. And the, I I think the thing that I'm continually surprised by is sort of the lack of awareness of how much they're becoming almost sort of lopsided with quotation Mm -hmm. marks. Um, and I think the, the, some of the progressions that we just mentioned are excellent, uh, tools to kind of help sort of bring things back a little bit more to a symmetrical point. Sure. And, you know, symmetrical is, uh, I think that's um, one of the greatest misperceptions um, about FMS um, and uh, kind of movement uh, stuff is you hear the word symmetry and you start thinking that, you know, you're trying to draw the Cartesian man, right? You're, you're, you're trying to have this, <laughs> this somehow you're going to perfect everyone. And that's, that's just not the case at all. Um, we look at symmetry of score, not symmetry of measure. So we're not, we're not busting out our laser measures and our tape measures and trying to get precise, uh, equal on both sides. We understand that there's right, left differences. And that's the beauty of a score uh, within the FMS. And, uh, like I said, if, unless I start seeing a difference of 15 plus percent, um, I don't get too worried about a, a right, left, uh, difference. And when something pops on a, on a movement screen or during training uh, for, uh, say, a one-sided athlete or somebody like that, that simply cues me to go check what underlies that um, so that I can make sure that, you know, if I get a baseball pitcher that's a 3-2 shoulder, uh, for the people listening who are not familiar with uh, the functional movement screen, uh, functionalmovement.com, and you can, uh, all kinds of things that you can look at there. Uh, But, you know, you get a 3-2 shoulder and a baseball pitcher, which we kind of expect, um, I'm still going to go check if their neck has the range of motion it should, if their breathing is good, if their T-spine is good, if their scapula can do. Because if I even open up just a little bit of buffer zone, I make that person a more durable athlete. So I I don't necessarily – there are times where change of score is not what I'm after. I'm just simply – a red flag was thrown. I do my due diligence to go down that pathway, make sure that there's not something significant underlying that. And if there isn't, we get on with we get on with life. So, yeah, the the symmetry thing is 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 very interesting. We uh, we're, we're not trying to uh, draw the the perfect individual. So, right on, awesome. Thank you, thank you for clarifying on that. That's great. Sure. Um, okay, uh, so kind of changing gears a little bit here. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more specifically about uh, some some strong first. So one of the um, questions I had. Um, from uh, from some colleagues in the Strong First community was for for those that are either preparing for the SFG one or the SFG two, um, you've put out guides to both of them. So mm-hmm. I, I will make sure I go back and, and find them and put those in the show notes that, that people can check out. But what are some things that people want to avoid doing in their training that um, I don't want to say hurt, but could you know, regress or put you in a bad spot as you get ready for the certification and how much time would you recommend in prepping for the level one and the level two? So let's go level one first, um, and, and chat about that. And, and, you know, the, the conversation there just has, 
where are you? Um, and I don't mean that in an overly existential sense, but you know, where are you in your training? Um, if you're gonna, if your snatch test bell is going to be a 24 for a guy or 16, uh, for a lady, um, and currently the, you're having trouble snatching the 12 kilo, then, you know, we need to look at our time frame of, of training being that, uh, we want you to be, we want you to come in and have a very great learning experience. Uh, it is a challenging weekend physically, but we want you to come in and have a very great learning experience. And if you're, um, if the weight that you're using or the snatch test is still a hundred percent effort for you, um, then I, I would allow more time for that weight to become a 70% weight, 80% weight for you so that <clears throat> you can move into the weekend confidently and have a great learning experience. So I would, I would say from an SFG one perspective, um, we see one of two things, uh, <laughs> too much attention on the snatch test not enough attention on the snatch test. Um, so we want to hit, uh, hit a mid range where we're certainly comfortable coming in and hitting, hitting the snatch test. Um, but that also means, uh, keeping our base of swings, making sure that our shoulder mobility is good. So that we're efficiently locking the bell out overhead and you're practicing your other skills. We've still got to practice double cleans and front squats and single military press and the get up and swings. So there's all of these things that we need to be practicing. And that was kind of the idea behind the prep article that I wrote was kind of laying out a path that gets you to both the snatch test and your, um, your other movements so that there's enough, uh, practice in there. And I would say approaching SFG one training with a little too much intensity is probably, um, one of the, one of the pitfalls. Um, we, we want you coming in, uh, healthy and, uh, ready to have a great learning experience. And, uh, the engine will only burn hot for so long before, uh, something happens. And, uh, if you're, um, I think people think training <clears throat> is somewhat like the uh, stock market. You, uh, did, if you talk to, uh, some people, they, they see the stock market as this, uh, or business in general as this just continuous upward trend. And the reality is, if you if you look at the ticker, uh, it's a whole lot of up and down. And so, creating those variations, um, it's okay to have an easy workout day. <laughs> um, I, I think people people operate under the mindset that uh, it's all you know hard style, and we're going to pound ourselves into the dirt. Um, there there are days where I go in and have a very purposefully easy workout. Um, there's days where I don't. Um, just try not to have too many of either of those days in a row and yep. make, mix them up. So, uh, so, so what would, uh, what would be an example of a, a, an easy quote unquote easy day for you? Something that you would do? Uh, one of my favorite workouts right now is, uh, Alexei, uh, Sinart wrote, um, uh, strength aerobics. He wrote an article on the site called strength aerobics. And, uh, basically, um, the, the, I have about 30 different versions of this that I use now, but the, the original article is take a single bell, clean, press, squat, set it down, shake it off, switch arms, clean, press, squat, set it down, shake it off. And basically you just maintain kind of a little bit of a mafetone, 180 minus your age sort of heart rate. Um, and you just want to get 15, 20, 30 minutes of work in where you're maintaining just a nice steady heart rate resting enough so that you're not hitting big peaks and valleys and you're just getting a nice, uh, nice steady workout in. Um, I, like I said, I've got a bunch of different versions of, of that that I use, but, uh, that's, that's the original idea. And so there's days where, uh, I'll just set a clock for 20 minutes, grab a 24 kilo bell, clean, press squat, shake it off, switch sides and keep going and just enjoy a little bit of movement, a little bit of, uh, uh, work. So, Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. That was, I'm glad that you could share that so that people get a, a, get a sense of it's okay to, you know, take an easy day so that, you know, we're, we're, we want to show up to the gym the next day. It's a, it's a long-term focus journey. Sure. Uh, and it's, uh, there quite simply, there's days where you should leave feeling like you could have done a lot more. And there's days where you should leave feeling like that was more than enough. <laughs> um, so it's, it's just having the variations. Um, there's a, 
I heard this at my original workshop with Pavel in 02, actually from one of the attendees. It's a saying from the Nordic uh, ski community, uh, only the mediocre are at their best all the time. I like so that. I like that. The, the rest of us need to have peaks and valleys, and um, that can be purposeful peaks or valleys, or that can be uh, where you burn the engine too hot and you end up having to take time off, so you have a, a valley, and then you uh, have to get started again. So there's there's all kinds of different variations of it, but uh, yeah, it's training should be uh, fun, um, dare I say, uh, fun. <laughs> And, um, so I, I think those are the, as far as SFG one, I'd say those are the, the biggest things allow enough time to get ready for the snatch test so that, um, and it, again, the snatch test shouldn't be a hundred percent effort. Uh, I think even in the article that I wrote, um, I have you building towards six or seven sets of 10 plus 10 at the top of a minute so that five is well within reach. Um, so it's just training for a little bit of overage. So the actual event is easier, um, for SFG two, uh, the biggest thing I see is people being in a hurry with the half body weight press. Uh, you need to lay out your programming, lay out your, um, have a good idea of where you are, where you need to go. Uh, make sure that your pressing form stays solid as you go heavier. Um, they, uh, I, I see a lot of people who, as they transition into heavier presses, the form changes and because the weight went up, they're, they're okay with that. Like they, their military press form really changes because, well, the weight went up and so they're going to keep hammering that. Um, when you see a change in, uh, movement, uh, in the, in the movement and in, in the quality of that, uh, press or exercise, then you need to kind of st- take a step back, and even though the weight went up, it may not have been the uh, the ideal uh, strategy for that. So, um, making sure that your military press form stays consistent, making sure that you allow enough time to uh, have those variations in uh, in intensity, in um, uh, easy and hard days uh, with your press training. Um, I'd say that's the biggest thing, um, and you still need to be ready for a snatch test. So there's a lot, and you're getting ready to do push presses and jerks, and there's uh, bent press, and there's all this overhead stuff. And so you need to um, allow for the fact that you're going to uh, have to pace and dose your training because you've got so much overhead work going on. And so from a programming perspective, you start to accept the fact that, um, as a, an old commercial told us, a dab will do you. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you just need a little bit of something um, because in the context of an overall program, uh, there's a lot of stress on certain areas. I would say that's – for level two, I'd say that's uh, – those two things are the, the biggest thing uh, for level two. Um, so – Awesome. Yeah, I've uh, spoken with with several that uh, individuals that are either prepping, have just gone through it, or um, some team leaders, and and they're like, you spend you know the majority of the weekend overhead. Um, yeah. So to to your point, you need to take in to consideration um, how that fits into your programming over the course of the week and month to month and over the year, um, while still keeping all the, the level one skills, uh, sharp. Absolutely. And, you know, going back to the running example that you gave, uh, just running as an example that you gave a little bit ago, um, if you run the numbers on running, um, and we just ballpark the fact that you're going to take about four times your body weight off with each step, which can go to 10 times body weight downhill or sprinting, or can, you know, it's, it, there's yeah. some, definitely some variation in there, but four times body weight is a good kind of ballpark, uh, figure. Um, 200 pound person running is producing 800 pounds of force on a single leg. Wow. Uh, 1500 steps per mile, uh, calculate the average, uh, calculate the tonnage on that workout. Um, just tremendous amount of load and force going through the body. Um, and that needs to be accounted for in, in some fashion. Um, 
there, there are athletes you work with that uh, because of the amount of jump training they do just playing their sport, plyometrics make up an exceedingly small percentage of their program. Whereas most people would think, oh, this is a jumping athlete. I need to jump them a lot. They're already jumping a lot uh, just in, in <laughs> practicing and playing their sport. Um, there might be some tactical stuff. There might be some slow strength that I need to go back and put in underneath that jumping ability. Um, so from a programming standpoint, we always want to uh, – you want to look. Uh, don't do the forest for the trees thing. Um, you, you want to – have this perspective from the 30,000 foot view looking at how this total impact is happening on the body for SFG level two, that turns out to be the shoulder and overhead work. And so you start having to um, dose those things appropriately because there's a greater overall dose by the time you're practicing everything. Yes, that's a great point. Great point. One, one other thought I, I had um, when you mentioned um, there can be changes in uh, your military press technique as the, the bell size goes up. Would a would a good um, you know habit or practice being uh, adding in uh, some some bottoms up work to maintain that that pressing groove? Absolutely, I, I think that um, the bottoms up press is a is a great way to uh, find your groove. Um, lockouts a little bit different, but uh, how you start the press uh, through three quarters of the press is going to be uh, probably a pretty good groove for you. Um, I like getting getting people uh, out of their heads a little bit, not thinking um, about just such the every micro millimeter of a of a movement. Uh, the bottoms up press certainly does that. Um, all of a sudden, you're very focused on keeping it uh, where it is and and performing the press. And, and again, this is a dabble uh, sort of thing where, you know, just a little bit to maintain the groove is, is probably, um, probably enough, uh, video yourself and have someone you trust review it. Um, I, I have a few friends that I can send videos to and get, uh, get very, uh, direct feedback, uh, on what I'm doing. Um, some people, if I sent it to uh, there are some people that I could send that to and they'd be like, oh, I, I can't critique him. You know, he's he's him. And it's like, dude, I'm I, you know, like I got as many problems in, in my technique as, as anybody else. And so I, I use my friends and, and people that I know are going to give me direct feedback. And um, I, I'm I do that on a, on a fairly regular basis. And it uh, it certainly helps a tremendous amount. So, you know, keeping an eye on yourself. Um, there's different realities of you know a, a fairly light person trying to press a fairly heavy bell. The bell gets pretty big. The offset center of mass becomes more of an issue. There's there's uniqueness as you start to go very heavy um, in a in a kettlebell press. Um, so we just kind of want to um, be aware of that um, and uh, keep an eye on yourself. Just because the weight went up doesn't mean that it was uh, what you were looking for. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. So this segues, uh, great into the next, next topic question. So building on that, what advice would you give to current SFG level ones who aren't sure whether to pursue the level two certification or at least research, uh, for the level one, because, you know, quote unquote, I know what I need at this point to, to teach my classes or my clients or, uh, level two, seems more about, you know, our own personal training, um, since most students may not be able to get towards some of those skills, like a, like a Brent press or a windmill because of some, some limitations that may show up in an FMS screen. Sure. Uh, I think the, the big thing there, uh, so when I was brought on as chief, uh, SFG, uh, my main, uh, main job is to uh, keep an eye on the curriculum, update the curriculum, make sure the manuals are updated, both for level one, level two, and the kettlebell course, the one-day course. And um, I've been, it's been behind the scenes work, but I've been very busy on those things. And so when you come through a level one research or a, uh, a level two workshop and you see the level one, the 2016 edition of the level one manual, 
um, I think you'll see uh, the work uh, that was done behind the scenes there. And uh, we're constantly, while the six basic drills have not changed, um, we're constantly uh, looking for um, a, a better way um, to, to do that. We had one of our uh, a, an instructor that I respect uh, very much, uh, Mr. Brandon Hetzler, um, who went through an SFG one as a student. Um, Brandon could teach, but he, you know, he went through as a as a student, um, and this is something that he's been doing and teaching and has has really delved into. Uh, he took a full notebook of notes uh, going wow. through the workshop. So when when you say it's it's uh, just like watching a movie again and catching a line that you missed the first time uh, or a scene that you missed the first time, um, going through the workshop, going through these skills again, um, getting your own form checked. You know, a lot of us end up in situations where we may not have three, four, five instructors around that we're friends with that we can get together and check each other's form and practice and, and do this kind of uh, teaching and skill development on an instructor level. Uh, the 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 research, the level one workshops, the level two workshops are great opportunities for that. Um, and people usually walk away with, wow, I didn't realize I was doing that. Um, and now I know a better way uh, to do it. So I, I think that, uh, you know, if, if somebody like Brandon can come through the workshop and, and have a great experience and take a bunch of notes uh, for somebody that, that really understands the material, um, I would say that we could all go back through the course and catch uh, different things, different tips, different cues um, that would help. Uh, pursuing level two, um, I a one-arm jerk, one-arm push press uh, is, if you're telling me your clients are snatching, then a one-arm push press, one-arm jerk, if they're pressing, uh, then those exercises are, are very accessible to a variety of clients. Some of the exercises we use to build up to the bent press and the windmill. Uh, I have uh, instructors now who some of those progressions are some of their favorite things to do with clients. It's opening their hips. It's creating all of this difference for them. Uh, we, uh, my goal with level two, and I, uh, I'm beta testing uh, some changes to the curriculum and schedule and things of that nature. And so, uh, what we see now in level two is a, a little a different flow of how we get through the drills that we're teaching. Uh, the addition of what I'm calling athletic drills, uh, which are um, a variety of moving uh, kettlebell drills that get us out of our uh, symmetrical stance, uh, stuck in one place uh, foot position, and get us moving in a, in a lot of really dynamic uh, athletic ways, um, taking the programming information and uh, having more of a group exercise focus, uh, we know a lot of our instructors take uh, take their SFG to their studio or you know wherever they're working, and they teach group classes. Uh, so we we try to um, we've tried to be responsive uh, to those, and uh, so moving forward from now into 2017, um, th those are the things you're going to see within level two. And I think um, a it's always worthwhile to come back, get your level one skills. Uh, checked and uh, find out if there's anything, <clears throat> pardon me, that you need to be doing differently. And then learning some of the level two drills and knowing that the progressions are accessible just to a tremendous range of people um, and can sometimes even be helpful in cleaning up movement. Um, and then these athletic drills that are just, they're fun, they're dynamic, they're fun, um, and a group exercise focus. Um, I think that, um, you know, the that idea that it, this is, and part of it is personal development. I, I think that going through some of these things is just keeping your blade sharp, keeping your skills dialed in, uh, taking the next step for yourself, and then figuring out how that works for your clients. But we've also got a lot of stuff in there that's very appropriate for a, a huge range of people and should be a continuation of your uh, strong first education. And, um, you know, if, if level two seems like, ah, eh, I'll wait on that. Cool. We've got uh, the body weight course. We've got the barbell course. We've, you know, we have these other offerings that are consistent in principle, but applied to these different tools and techniques that create a real good continuity within our school of strength. Yeah, that's that's one of my uh, favorite things is sort of 
the cohesiveness across um, the three different modalities um, and how the the principles and the concepts just fit so well together. Um, I think that's one of the things that, that makes it really unique in that you can apply some of the, you know, uh, drills and skills that you learn from uh, the body weight certification or course into the kettlebell or the barbell and, and vice versa. Absolutely. Um, that's, you know, we have three branches, um, in the school and, uh, they all, uh, have their unique points and they all interrelate. So we're, we're really happy actually with, uh, with, with where we are right now from, a, um, I feel good about where the, the SFG curriculum is. Doc Hartle's working on the SFL and Karen's working on the SFB. So we've got, uh, got good stuff going on all the way around. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so kind of on that note, is there anything that, that, um, you've already alluded to some of it, but is there anything coming down in terms of the, the, the future for strong first that, you may want to share with, with the audience that, uh, is in development and, um, you know, sort of overall, uh, you touched heavily kind of on the, the, uh, SFG curriculum there. Yep. Um, so continued refinement, uh, as far as SFG level one, level two is concerned, uh, the, the kettlebell course, one day course been, uh, really great for us. Uh, we're, um, numbers are getting better, uh, every year, more people are coming through, um, like I said, there's there's more uh, development looking at uh, the SFL and SFB uh, courses. Um, we just launched the new website, uh, which was a major, major project. Um, blood, sweat, and many tears uh, went into uh, finishing that. And um, <clears throat> so I, you talked about the articles. You can now go to the article section, search by author. And so you can put me in and my whatever 20 some odd articles will pop up, um, that I've, that I've done. So, um, we're going to have more information coming out. Uh, Pavel has been, um, and, and it's, again, it's behind the scenes stuff. Uh, sometimes it's, it's like a deep river. Uh, when you're looking at the surface, you don't see much going on, but once you dive in and get sucked down river, you realize there's, uh, there's a <laughs> lot going on. And, uh, that's, that's kind of been strong first for the last year or two because we've had so much going on. And, uh, <clears throat> so Pavel will, uh, be finishing, um, some materials here soon that'll be out. And, um, that's, uh, that's all that I can talk about. That's, that's, that's enough. That's enough for me. And that'll be enough for the audience. That's exciting. I'll definitely, uh, be keeping, keeping an eye and an ear out for, for when that stuff, uh, is released. Um, awesome. Very, very excited for that. Um, so do you briefly want to touch on, um, I know we just kind of got done the, the, uh, plan strong and the, the leadership meeting. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, um, you know, what, what takes place at the leadership meeting and then, um, what is Plan Strong, and, and why should um, even if you're not um, someone that is a strong first instructor, may be interested in learning more about um, the programming and teachings at, at Plan Strong? So the leadership meeting um, <clears throat> combination of opportunity for HQ, uh, the headquarters staff, to get together, progress uh, certain business projects, and and just details behind the scenes. Uh, meeting with our leadership, uh, master seniors, team leaders. Um, I'm I'm honored every time because you know the we have a variety of people who are passionate uh, enough about what we do that they want to be in this leadership position. Give up time from family, business, uh, friends, in order to be a part of this leadership meeting. Give us their input and work with us uh, in this thing that we, uh, we are passionate about called Strong First. Um, so the, the meeting is about uh, letting, getting everybody on the same page, making sure that uh, our, uh, our goals, visions, and mission are all uh, really well understood by everyone. Um, two great books uh, that I read recently, uh, Legacy, which is about the New Zealand All Blacks, uh, how they created the culture of their team, and how it applies to business, uh, and then extreme ownership, which is uh, a couple of Navy SEALs um, wrote that. Um, Jocko and Leaf are the uh, first names. Their their last names escape me at the moment, but extreme ownership. And, and one of the things they talk about is this, this concept of uh, decentralized command, meaning there's, there's a head person that's running the 
uh, create this mission, this thing, <clears throat> and that mission and goals are transmitted to different levels to the people who are going to go out and enact that mission goal plan. And so that having that understanding through allows people who are out trying to accomplish that goal to react to the situation in front of them and know that they're still sticking to the mission, the goals, the principles of what we do. And so leadership meetings are that opportunity to bring people together, solidify and, and coordinate those, those visions, goals, and things that we want to do uh, as a group. And um, it's, it's, a, it's just um, – it's an amazing. It is an amazing thing to be a part of. I'm. Uh, I count my blessings on a on a regular basis. That That's I've so cool. That is trusted so cool. With that. Yeah. Awesome. Definitely. Awesome. Um, okay. And then the other part of that is uh, for those that aren't familiar, what is ah, plan, plan strong? Plan strong. Plan strong, in my opinion, would be kind of like a graduate course in in programming strength training. Um, the uh, I don't know if I can describe it any better than that. That's um, great. That's perfect. You're, you're going to you're going to get some of your preconceived notions of intensity and and volume uh, shaken. You're going to see a different way to apply those uh, variants within your training um, that has been very successful within within certain groups. And um, it, there's some math involved, uh, so be be prepared for that. But uh, walk away with the principles of uh, of what what he's giving you from a program design standpoint, and it can be uh, it, it can certainly be very interesting. We 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 do have more coming out on that on the next uh, couple of years. So awesome, very cool, very cool. Um, okay, uh, so anything else you want to uh, kind of summarize or touch on in regards to strong first and or kettlebells before we shift gears completely to a different topic? Um. I, I guess, you know, coming off the leadership meeting, just, just feeling, um, you know, no pressure at all, uh, taking the, uh, the house that Pavel built and, uh, moving forward, uh, with it, uh, from a, from a chief instructor standpoint, uh, honored to work with the people that I do, um, very looking forward to the future, um, and, and seeing some really great stuff, uh, coming down the pipe and, um, kettlebell continues to be my, my go-to. It's, it's the thing that, it, that uh, uh, I enjoy uh, training with the most, actually. That is awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's, um, it's so cool to hear you talk about these things, and I'm excited for what's going to be coming down the, the pipeline in the future and everything. And um, I, I can just see the organization uh, continuing to grow. So it's, it's Definitely. awesome. Um, okay, so I got a, a question. Um, you recently authored an article uh, for uh, Functional Movement Systems. Great, great article. Um, Thank you. The, it discussed the relationship between the uh, foot and ankle and then the hip in terms of setting your foot position. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, the, I believe it was the, the lock and rock, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so in that, you talk about um, – we have the, the purpose and intent for a screen and then our foot position for when we're executing uh, an exercise. And there's a critical difference between the two. Absolutely. Um, so one, um, why is that important uh, mm -hmm. for, for people to know both in terms of clientele and um, trainers or instructors? And two, um, how that uh, relationship affects one another. Um, I'll link to the article so they you you kind of go into a personal story there, but sure. Well, they're my favorite kind of story. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you know the we're going to stick with the symmetrical stance uh, concept right now. So within the FMS, the deep squat is our symmetrical stance um, movement pattern that we check. Um, for that, in order to have a consistent, repeatable uh, movement, we standardize foot position. And we standardize foot position as feet straight ahead, shoulder width apart. And uh, that, um, if we're, you know, two inches apart to 10 inches apart to 20 inches apart to one foot forward, one foot back, one foot turned out, one foot not, our, 
the consistency and reliability of what you're looking at is gone. And so using it as a movement baseline, uh, we want to standardize that foot position and have those feet straight ahead. It creates the position where you have to have the most control of that movement in order to score well. And it makes the mistakes easy to see. So from a movement screening standpoint, we're, we have no choice. We, we need to standardize. Um, and, and that gets us our consistency and reliability. Once we transition into load and we're exercising, uh, we want to individualize that foot position. I, I want you to use the amount of turnout that you need in that symmetrical stance so your hips stay happy. Uh, the, the example that I give, uh, the, the personal story is uh, my alpha angle in my right hip is uh, 61 degrees, uh, anterior labrum is completely torn, anterior superior labrum is torn with two paralabral cysts. Uh, left hip is fairly similar, 55, 57 degree alpha angle, and uh, some other stuff going on in there um, as well. Yet, when I turn my feet out, when I adjust to my unique structure, um, I perform very well. Um, swing squats, uh, deadlifts, snatches, whatever. Um, that symmetrical stance adjustment works for me. And so from an exercise standpoint, when we add load, if you take that running example again, uh, four times body weight. Well, with a 24 kilo bell, two handed swing, I can produce uh, three times body weight eccentric load at the bottom of my uh, swing. So if my if I create a situation where, due to my hip structure, my hip stops, your body will get that motion from somewhere, and it's usually your back, and that's usually a bad idea. And so, optimizing foot position uh, for the hip allows my hip to do what it's supposed to, my back to do what it's supposed to, um, kind of helps keep things happy. And, uh, I'm all about keeping things happy. <laughs> um, so that, those are the, those are the real big differences. And, you know, uh, movement screening is, is movement screening. It's, uh, it's this whole other thing that we're doing where we need consistency and reliability exercises where we're imparting loads. Sometimes very, the numbers get very large. I want to make sure that I've created the optimal individual situation, to handle those. Yeah, I, that, that article really, uh, resonated with me personally. Um, it, it just, one, it, it made total sense. I was able to connect the dots between the, the, the screening and, and exercise and, and the points that you, uh, just reiterated to the audience. But, but the other thing that it started to make me, um, take into consideration was sort of outside the gym being someone that, that works a lot with rowers, whether they're on the uh, rowing machine, uh, ergometer, or water rower, or different, different, the row perfect, or in a boat, one of the things those athletes have to deal with is that their feet are um, tied into shoes, and their their feet are basically in, in a neutral position. So they don't have the ability to turn their feet out. Now there is some play in terms of the foot stretcher in creating a little bit more width between each individual foot. Um, but that's variance that those athletes are not afforded, um, you know, at least to my knowledge currently and being able to turn the feet out. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that this is becoming more interesting to me um, and your article started to connect the dots is one of the things that is starting to become <clears throat> more, uh, or there's a higher incidence of is, uh, labral tears in the hip in female collegiate rowers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is starting to continue to spike up over the last three to five years. Uh, there's been more and more kind of focus on the, the hip area and the lumbopelvic region. Um, but it wasn't until I read your article and then looking at sort of the, the, the rowing shell and the, the erg that I was like, wow, the foot position could be playing a major, major factor in, in what's happening. It definitely could. Um, and, and those are unique. I mean, you get into a sp specific sporting situation. Um, you would probably find that uh, elite rowers who have uh, adapted well into the sport actually have the hip that supports that position. Um, that as you, uh, and when you look at uh, just some structural differences between male and female and Q angles and, and uh, some some different things that are going on. The the foot position could be a um, uh, a part of what's happening. Um, I think labral tear wise, we're we're better at recognizing it. Um, FAI has become the uh, diagnosis du jour, 
um, and uh, is something that's, uh, you know, everybody's got it now. Um, and probably people had it for many years prior to our better diagnosis of it. Um, but, but I do think that, um, so just to draw this out just a little bit, when you're, so for me, it's the turn, I turn the feet out, but that, that also means that I have to spend time stretching my hip rotators because I'll get tight in that externally, uh, rotated position. So I spend time stretching my hip rotators in the other direction a la windmills and some of the, the half kneeling work that we do. Um, so for that athlete who's, um, they know they're going to be in the, in the rig, uh, with the feet locked into those pedals. Um, and Hey, uh, somebody probably designed those so that you get an optimal stroke and uh, good power production. So not, not going to argue with that, but I know that when I step off of the rower, uh, or that situation that places me in that unique sport, position, I'm probably going to, um, um, I'm probably going to ad adjust the other direction, let them experience the other range of motion, uh, so that we start balancing things out just, uh, just a little bit. Um, so, um, it, it'll be interesting to see where that goes over the next uh, few years. Yeah, for sure. And that's a great tip, um, that some, some rowers or other athletes that might be kind of having to stay in uh, that symmetrical stance or lock kind of foot position for their activity or sport to make sure that when they get out of that, they're, they're, um, you know, bring stretching and mobility into that, that area in the opposite direction. Yeah. Just, uh, visit, visit the, the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, another, uh, FMS topic. So, Ankle breakouts uh, mm -hmm. for the deep squat and or pistol. Um, mm -hmm. So need a huge um, amount of range of motion through the, the hip and uh, the ankle and to get into that, that overhead deep squat position as well as the, the pistol. So for anybody there that's going uh, potentially for the, the SFB or and or the, the beast tamer at some point, what are some uh, considerations um, that you want to make sure you have prerequisites, I should say, before we're adding load. So, uh, the thing that'll surprise you is, uh, you can actually deep squat very well with, uh, somewhat limited ankle mobility, not locked ankles, but you can have somewhat limited ankle mobility and still deep squat. Well, um, the pistol, however, will typically not tolerate, uh, the, the restriction at the ankle. And for myself with the hip structure that I have, I was, I had to max out my ankle uh, because I couldn't get some of the range from my hip. So, uh, just, you know, there's some individual variance there as far as which piece of the chain, uh, will become, uh, the, an important, um, focus. Um, the ankle, uh, if you look at it clinically, um, and you're, you're measuring degrees of loaded ankle dorsiflexion, um, you're going to, you're going to be looking for a pretty, pretty large number. Uh, 40 plus minimum and, and usually towards 50 degrees of active ankle dorsiflexion. Um, and that all, you know, some of that is just dependent on the amount of load because uh, it's a loaded active ankle dorsiflexion, meaning you're weight bearing. Um, your passive measures will never come close to that. So there's, there's a difference in what we're looking at there. Um, you really want to be able to take your knee past your toes without any sort of uh, collapse um, let's just, let's just ballpark it at four inches, uh, as a minimum, um, with a quality ankle movement, um, pay attention for any pain or pinching in the front of the ankle. Um, if it's a stretch in back, might just need a little soft tissue work, something of that nature. And you start trying to do a pistol, you start trying to squat, uh, in particular the pistol and you start kind of maxing out that ankle uh, in trying to keep the heel down, and you start getting that pinch or pain up front. Uh, get that checked. That's that's not something to ignore. That's that's some joint impingement that's going on there that that could be really influencing uh, what you're doing there. And uh, as you start to adapt or modify around that pinch, you can you can actually cause some uh, some problems. Right. So we might that might be an instance where perhaps potentially the, the talus has slid a little bit forward and it's not able to kind of move around the, the tibia and fibula. Yeah. I mean, you, you can, the, it, it's 
foot and ankle is a, uh, I made the joke earlier, it's a mini splendored thing. And uh, <laughs> the, the foot and ankle is as well because you can get into um, having some rigidity or lack of motion in the midfoot can influence the ankle. The ankle can be perfect, but the midfoot doesn't move. Or you can be subtalar or you can be the actual tailor joint. Um, there, there can be multiple things that are happening in that coordinated effort between the foot and the ankle um, that, that are impacting that ankle mobility. Um, some of this stuff is self-service. Uh, some of this stuff you're going to need a manual therapist or somebody who's skilled uh, in looking at the joint and uh, looking at the differences between midfoot, subtalar, and tailor and uh, how those things work together. Um, and, you know, if, if ankle mobility is not changing, get help. Like the, there's, there's people that do that and, uh, you can, you can access that help and, and usually save yourself uh, a bunch of time, um, in, in moving forward uh, with your ankle mobility. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Shifting gears again to a different topic. Mm-hmm. So I've had several people ask me this question. They wanted, they wanted to know the answer to this. Uh, if or when, is the CK, CK FMS coming back? So uh, it's already back. It's called foundational strength. Um, so we are um, we've made some adaptations. Uh, it is now a three day instead of a four day course. The requirement coming in is uh, the FMS level one, uh, which you can do online. And then it's three days of a combination of um, level FMS level two plus kettlebell correctives plus some live case studies. Um, so we've kind of morphed um, from the old program to the new. And, um, yeah, that's called uh, foundational strength. And we're, um, we're running that more through FMS now than, uh, than strong first. Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, I will be sure to be checking that out in the future. Um, I'm, I'm working on finalizing a date for early 2017 as we speak. So awesome. I already said scheduled to be in the UK, um, teaching one the f- first weekend of February, I believe 2017. Excellent. Um, so have those coming up and, um, yeah, that's always been a, uh, that's a fun thing to teach. It's a uh-huh. good time. I'm sure I'm looking forward to, uh, to checking that one out in person. That's going to be awesome. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are very excited to, to hear that because the, uh, uh, the, the feedback I've gotten from, from those that have attended, um, the, the current, the current, um, course or the, the previous one, or to have checked out the DVD product has been just outstanding. Um, so looking forward to, to learning more about that and diving a little bit deeper into, uh, the kettlebell. It's a fun thing to dive into. It is. Um, okay. Uh, so historical perspective of the uh, FMS and how it's evolved. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, the deep squat was one of the, the first patterns that was addressed. Now, um, the the focus in terms of the, the algorithm is we look at the primitive patterns um, and focusing on mobility uh, so active straight leg raise or shoulder mobility first, and then stability being um, the rotary stability or the trunk stability push up. Um, so what what led to uh, that change? So yeah, it's uh, I was at the first ever FMS workshop, which was sometime around ninety eight, ninety nine, um, quite some time ago. And uh, the screens are the same. The screen screen. Um, you know, we've clarified some details. The verbal instructions assist us. And running the screen well, uh, there's there's some things like that that have been done, but the the screen is basically the screen. Uh, from a corrective standpoint, yeah, the when I learned it in ninety eight, ninety nine, I, I can't remember when it was. Um, it was deep squat first, and uh, the the corrections were basically versions of the the tests themselves. And um, what led to progressing the corrective algorithm was it didn't work, uh, so we thought we had this idea that we just do X and then when we applied it, scores didn't change. And so uh, we is kind of back to the drawing board of how we were going to do that um, over time between uh, the time I had taken that workshop and then started working with Gray in 06. Um, I was able to come in and bring 
uh, not only kettlebells and some of this other information uh, that I had learned over the years, but Gray had progressed uh, the correctives as well. And so when we came back together and compared notes and put things together, we ended up in a much uh, a much better place from a corrective standpoint. And that led to the development of the Level 2 workshop and the, uh, the algorithm now uh, starting with leg raise and shoulder, moving on to rotary and trunk stability, and then uh, inline lunge, hurdle step, deep squat. Um, that um, came out of knowing that uh, we need a certain amount of uh, mobility uh, at certain key areas in order to have um, good proprioception, good, good uh, knowledge of our body, so to speak. And then knowing that we need to control movement, uh, so those rotary stability, trunk stability uh, screens become important. And those are the things that kind of underlie the top three patterns. And so the results uh, that we've gotten by, by applying the algorithm, being able to efficiently change movement with some of our, some of our correctives, but also just the knowledge that uh, sometimes the most powerful thing I can do for you, when I, when I run a screen and I, I look at the results, some of the most, probably the most powerful thing I can do for you is uh, protect you from something that you need to stop doing for a minute or two. Um, maybe your movement's gunked up because you've just been burning the engine too hot. And I need to kind of pull things back just a little bit. Um, maybe the the bench has been a little too much of a focus, and so we got a little shoulder mobility stuff going on. Maybe we just need to switch gears and not bench so much, and all of a sudden, you know, shoulders do great. Um, so sometimes it's not uh, my my first thought in working with a client is not, "Ooh, how am I going to do a corrective on this?" My first thought is, "What do I need to kind of protect this person from? What in their environment or their habits or their?" exercise or whatever the case may be, what, what do I need to take a look at uh, to, to maybe allow this person to have a better, uh, better experience? Awesome. Awesome. That's a, I think that's a great piece of advice there is, is knowing, okay, this is what we kind of need to eliminate from their programming, at least for the time being off the bat, they shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. What not to do. I mean, if you just look at it financially, you know, there's, there's, things that you probably don't need to be spending your money on. And uh, when you eliminate those, wow, you know, like there's money in the checking account. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's kind of just the same, the same philosophy. Sometimes it's not, um, it's not about the corrective. It's, it's about uh, just simply taking a good look at the program, making sure that that's good, making sure that uh, rest, regeneration, nutrition, uh, there's, there's many things uh, that are involved there. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. So you recently, uh, put out a brand new course, um, uh, in conjunction with, uh, FMS, uh, on Indian club swinging. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I had the, uh, the honor of, uh, attending the, uh, workshop last summer with, with yourself, Dr. Thomas and, and, uh, master SFG Phil Scurrito. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's, what's in the, uh, the new course, uh, digital course and, um, you know, for, for those that aren't familiar, what are some of the benefits of, uh, Indian club swinging? So Indian club swing is, um, it's probably something I need to talk more about. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, probably one of the best ways I know of to develop an efficiently integrated mobile, uh, upper body, uh, that you can also put in with lower body patterns to develop a lot of movement skill and coordination, um, possibilities are almost endless uh, with them, but it starts from a very, uh, y you want to have a foundation to start from. And so the goal of the online course is to take um, a lot of the stuff that we did in Club Swinging Essentials and put it in a very accessible format. And so uh, you'll see movements number one, two, three, four, and five. If you're familiar with Club Swinging Essentials, you're going to see those. Uh, maybe a couple different coaching tips and, and just ways that I've started to, to coach those. But also, um, I wanted the, the online course to be relaxed. Uh, I didn't want people to do kind of what they did with the getup of getting uh, over precise in what they were doing. I want you to swing clubs. There are things that we're looking for. There are aspects, um, we, call it, we just call it precision. There's precision that we're looking for uh, within the club swinging movements. I want to see that you maintain a neutral wrist. 
that you cast and catch the club correctly, that you're driving the elbow into an inner circle uh, as you're performing uh, movements number one and two. And that continues into three, four, and five. Um, so th there are these precision things that, I, that, uh, that we want to look for over time. Uh, but I want more people swinging clubs. Um, new material, there's some commentary from Gray. There's uh, two new patterns, the Indian Club Swing and Slam, uh, that are in there. And uh, basically, you'll if you order a set of clubs at this point, uh, if they're an FMS-branded one-pound club, you get the course. You, you get a little card in the box, and you can log on, and, and, and you get the course. If you already have Indian Clubs and you're interested in the course, it's nine ninety nine. dollars you, uh, You'll waste more money at Starbucks this week uh, <laughs> than that course will cost you. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's a it's, it's a really wanting to spread the word there and, and get more people swinging clubs. Um, and they're they're fun. They are very fun. Um, like I said, I had the, the pleasure of uh, being there last year in person and, and learning from you. Um, and I think one of the one of the best quotes I heard you say was, um, we, we kind of get into it and we're just swinging continuously for, for a couple of minutes. Uh, you can kind of almost smells like, like bacon is cooking cause, cause everybody's nervous system gets, you know, fired up. And it's, uh, I think people don't see that on the surface. They're like, Oh, so, you know, you're, you're swinging clubs around. What is this? And they start doing it and they, they realize how much of a, a demand is being placed on the nervous system. Absolutely. It's, uh, there's a lot of learning going on. We're yes. doing a lot of, we're crossing midline. We're doing some, uh, complementary or opposing patterns. There's, uh, continuous alternating patterns. There's, and then we start adding either, uh, deep knee bends or footwork into it. And we've got, uh, a lot happening, uh, through the brain and, uh, and, and we're learning a lot about ourselves, uh, with this kind of, um, I like to think of it a little more as a moving meditation, uh, where I can just uh, relax and swing clubs, and uh, th there's a lot going on. Yes, there is, and they're like you said, they're they're a ton of fun. Um, that is probably one of my um, things that I've integrated into my my own training and practice. Is uh, in addition to like fast and loose drills, I think they are a wonderful complement when you are doing some hard style kettlebell training to just bring everything kind of back down and, and calm the body back down, uh, reset to the diaphragmatic breathing. And again, for anybody that may be interested in taking a, a level two strong first kettlebell certification, doing a lot of overhead work, this is something that will uh, assist and help keep the, the shoulders uh, healthy. Absolutely. Um, it's restorative. And uh, we've we've lost that from a fitness standpoint to a to a great degree. Uh, we like burning the engine hot. We like our high intensity intervals. We like uh, like I do enough heavy. Like heavy is not hard for me. I, I've got big bells. I can get a barbell. Heavy is easy. Like I have access to that on a continual basis. Um, light, precise, integrated, uh, restorative was something that I did not have. Uh, in my training. And so it, it hits this other end of the spectrum for me. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's really, really good for me. And, uh, um, many of the people who start swinging clubs, uh, really appreciate that, um, that balance between the heavy and tough and the light, precise restorative. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's one of the things I, I remember you, you said that exact quote on, on Dr. Nicholson's podcast and, um, that was something that really, again, resonated with me because we spend sort of so much time to that kind of, that one side of the spectrum and there's a lot to be had. We, we talk about it in strong first a lot, you know, there's two sides of performance uh, coin tension and relaxation. And, and we can err on the side of focusing a lot on the tension. And, and that's one thing that I've tried to get back to recently in the last few months is, okay, let's spend a little bit more time trying to sort of accentuate the relaxation side and getting good at getting really relaxed and, get, and being able to create a lot of tension when I, when I want on demand. Absolutely. And uh, one of the best ways to go faster is to relax, right. um, which is uh, maybe counterintuitive and, and doesn't sound very hard style, but uh, it's uh, right tool, right principle, right technique for the right time. And... Um, being able to hit both sides of that coin well 
um, is a key to um, uh, key to performance, key to longevity. Uh, there's there's just a lot going on there, and you're right. We we push uh, in one direction, typically because we're good at it. Like I, <clears throat> uh, strong was uh, something that I enjoyed and something that I was decent at, and so for me to focus <clears throat> in that direction was not tough. It's just where it's just where it took me. Um, shifting gears and doing things that asked me to be coordinated. Oh my! Like the, it was <laughs> like, what is this? And uh, so it it's it's definitely. Um, my clients find out really quick. I find the thing that I find your weak link, uh, and I put my bullseye on it, and I don't let you escape. Um, you can wiggle and you can complain all you want. We're working on your weakest link. Um, it, I'm going to make you uncomfortable, but we're going to get better, and that's the uh, that's the key. Awesome, awesome. I love it. Um, so, so final question before we move into the rapid fire: Is there any other new material? Um, uh, outside of the the strong first curriculum, uh, potentially a future product that you may be working on projects um, that you want to share or tease out to the to the audience, make them aware of that that might be coming down the pipeline. You know, honestly, between what we're currently doing with Indian clubs and where we we have goals for that, where I'm taking the uh, SFG level one and level two curriculum and the work I'm doing within that group, the other things we have going on within FMS, plus my own personal training slash online clients. Um, I, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally, totally understandable. I just, I had to ask for myself just because I, I've, I've got pretty much most of, if not all of the, the products that you've put out. So, um, I wanted to, to make sure I asked the, one of the, there's two I'm aware of. I, I know it's now it's only a digital product is, uh, I think it was kettlebells for, for personal trainers. So you, you did with, uh, Michael Castro Giovanni. Sure. Um, okay. Pronounce it yep. correctly. Okay, good. Yep. And then K- KB basics. Um, it, it was kettlebell basics for strength coaches and personal trainers. And I think we shortened the title to KB basics and that is movementlectures.com and, uh, kettlebells for power athletes, uh, which I did with Jeff O'Connor. And, uh, there's some, there's some good stuff in there. I know, I know. I'm, I'm uh, gonna, they're going to be added to the the library soon. <laughs> awesome. You know, it's it's funny. Um, just kind of a tangent on that. Um, I've really spent the last 13 years with Pavel, the last 10 years with Gray, working within those two uh, groups slash organizations. Uh, my perspective has been that if you want me. If, if you bring me in for a workshop, that's what you're going to get anyway. Like it, I <laughs> right. do strong first F, like it's what I do. And so I don't have this separate Brett Jones brand hanging out here because what I do is strong first FMS. Um, I blend it, shape it to the individual. Uh, I have clients that don't touch kettlebell. Um, it's just the individual in front of me will dictate my choices and, and where I uh, take that. But my perspective over the last over decade has been these, are, this is what I'm passionate about. These are the people, the principles, the things that I believe in, and that's where I'm going to do my work. And so um, perhaps not the wisest choice from a, from a business perspective, um, but people know where to find me. They know, they know to find me within those two groups and, and great podcasts like this. Thank you. Uh, but I, I totally agree with you. I, I remember, I think it was on Scott Ardella's podcast, or it might have been on another one. But but one of the things that you said, again, that jumped out to me and really resonated with me was um, Scott asked you, I think, a question on sort of if you had advice for, for those that are just starting off training, being an instructor. And it was very clear. Um, I remember this. You said, you know, spend time, pick an area that, that interests you. And, um, go a mile deep and inch wide, uh, because if you start going all over the place, you kind of just, uh, quote unquote, muddy the waters. I remember you said, and, um, you know, that's, that's something that, that I'm trying to do. I want to get deeper into the kettlebell. I want to learn more, more about it from a training and historical standpoint and have an appreciation because I feel like that is the way to become a really good instructor. 
Um, and the more I can know about it, the, the better teacher I can be and more effective I'm going to be. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, the, new, the new trainer gets excited, and that's, that's great. Uh, but the problem is by the time you're a new trainer and you've collected 10 different workshops in a, in a two-, three-year period, um, that becomes a stew that's hard to pick a flavor out of. Um, if you take your time and go, go kind of a little bit more measured, um, you have a chance to develop a philosophy, to have a, a thing, a, a, a base that you can uh, grow and develop from. Um, for me, if I was getting started in the field right now, um, and, and Mike Boyle's fun, uh, certified functional strength coach, um, I think, and, and I think he's on functional strength coach six or, you know, whatever the, the thing is, I, I think Mike does a great job of, uh, FMS principles are in there. Um, he does a great job of providing, uh, a really good way to get started with people. Um, it's safe, it's effective, it's, it, you can repeat it. Add in FMS and strong first, and now you've got strength and kettlebell principles. You've got movement, um, kind of, you can evaluate, look at movement, make appropriate referral, and, uh, and do the best thing for your client. So that combo, I think, is a great base um, to get started with. Um, and then from there, uh, you can start looking at where you want to go and, and the piece of advice. And, and I think I said this on Scott's podcast as well, uh, pick something you don't agree with and learn about it. Right. And, um, it will challenge you because you may just find out that thing you didn't like has some pretty good stuff in it. For sure. For sure. Yeah. That's, that's some of the, some of the advice I've just, you've, you've laid out of taking a heart and try to continue to, to implement it and just enjoying the journey. You know, it's uh, realizing that it's uh, not trying to be in a rush and, and um, you know, devour as much <laughs> material as possible. Like I, I go back and uh, still refer back to the course manuals and the certification manuals because it's just they're they're like this thick, but it's so dense and the 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 nuances are, are are so powerful you just have to take the time to like read reread it and apply it and reread it and apply it and go back and forth um, so. well, i know there was uh there was an instance where dave whitley was talking about uh he had gotten the dvd set from the original ckfms workshop and he had kind of turned to grab a drink and um and he heard something on screen and he's like when did they say that? I must have gone to the bathroom or I must have been out of the room. <laughs> and he comes back in and on the screen, he is front row staring at Gray as he said whatever Gray had just said that Dave did not remember. And so um, you're, you're going to keep a certain percentage of a live experience. Um, revisiting that is all because there's a ton of information put out during those weekends. Yep. Yep. A ton. A ton. Awesome. Uh, any final thoughts before we move into rapid fire questions? Um, no, I think let's, uh, let's get her done. All right. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, Brett, given your, your current, uh, experience and knowledge, uh, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I, that, it, that's always a rough question. Um, I think that, um, I'm in such a, I'm in a great place in my life and my career. I think, um, I think if I, if I would do anything differently, it would be a little, little bit of a focus on, from a business standpoint, be a little bit of a focus on, um, uh, a, a, a personal brand, so to speak. Uh, but I've, I've had such success and growth within the groups that I teach with that I don't even know if I'd give myself uh, that piece of advice. Um, um, I've made some mistakes training wise um, that I would probably advise myself, my younger self to uh, be patient. Uh, when I was powerlifting, I wanted to hit raw elite yesterday and uh, that, that became uh, a little bit of an issue. And so I, I think, um, I think my young. I think I would tell my younger self to uh, cultivate patience uh, earlier on. Um, I consider myself to be a fairly patient uh, person now uh, because I've, I've 
just been through some situations that have uh, given me that lesson. And um, that's, I think that pays off. That's a big dividend there in being patient. Awesome. Excellent advice. Um, much easier question here, number two. What is your favorite strength training exercise if you have to pick one? Um, you know, Gray uh, tells the story in Dynami of having worked with an Olympic lifting coach who, when asked um, if he could only do one exercise, it would be the clean and, and I think it was clean and push press or clean and jerk, one or the other. And see, that's sneaky because you there's two exercises in there. <laughs> uh, so um, I've joked for a long time, if you locked me in a room with a 16-kilo bell, uh, I'll come out stronger uh, on the other side of that. Um, obviously, there's a lot I can do with that 16-kilo bell. The debate for me is uh, get-ups or swings as far as which exercise I would uh, – if I if you restricted me to only one. Um, so there's there's my – non-specific uh i didn't really answer your question that's all right that's good looking at a career in politics <laughs> all right um next question how has your training changed today compared to 10 years ago uh like i said i, I think it's the patience aspect um i've i've been through i had a pulmonary embolism in 09 and and i just uh, i had a, a melanoma uh situation here that uh you know, surgical excision, melanoma in C2, everything's okay. Um, but, you know, I've been through a couple of situations but have uh, realized that uh, um, there's time right. and I want there to be time. And so patience um, is something that uh, I think uh, unless I'm getting paid to make that next rep, um, I pretty much set the bell down now. So. That's, that's great advice. That's great advice. Um, okay. We talked about, uh, injuries and training, uh, before, uh, next question is what's one thing that, that junior athletes, so the, the high school, uh, bracket, they should be doing more of to complement their training and their health. Uh, obviously get into some a great deal of individual variation with that, uh, whether it's uh, a kid who's a little more hypermobile that needs, uh, some good, um, stability and movement work or whether it's a stiff kid that needs a little more movement work. Um, in general, I think youth athletes, um, because they can get away with stuff that, that young frame is, uh, resilient at a, at a stage, uh, where they're, um, they're able to handle some, uh, I'm just going to say bad training stresses. Um, you need some good basic strength training. Um, you should be able to do, uh, pushups, uh, good pushups, good pull-ups. You should own, uh, at least like an airborne lunge sort of single leg, uh, squat slash single leg deadlift. Um, you should have a basic understanding of some of the basic barbell lifts. And then for power training, I think swings, um, are, something that a, that a youth uh, athlete can, can benefit greatly from. So I, I think realizing that um, the, there's, a, there's a mix there, um, depending on what the individual needs. Um, Pavel likes to joke, uh, vegetables for health, uh, steak for strength. Um, we want to be sure we're doing the vegetables. We want to be sure we're doing things that keep us healthy, that, that make us resilient over time. And just good basic strength training does that. Um, and then Power production with the kettlebell is unique because of the unique eccentric load and the and the the things that we're able to achieve there. Get ups make sure that we're kind of going well from right to left sides and um, not uh, maybe looking at the early specialization trend as well, knowing that you need at least another sport in there that that gets you out of um, out of your familiar postures and patterns. Awesome, awesome. <clears throat> what's your what's your best tip? to improve recovery post-training session? Uh, number one is don't push too hard in the training session. Um, and don't burn the engine too hot um, unless it's a day where you're going to burn the engine hot. I mean, we're going to have those days. Uh, NASCAR cars, get you test drive them uh, to make sure they're ready for a race. Uh, but then they go back in the shop and they get worked on. So um, step one is know which kind of training day it is and know where you're pushing. Look at your trend of sleep, 
nutrition and general recovery. Um, maybe just because the, uh, um, just because the, uh, the training day is X, maybe it needs to be Y. Um, so making those adjustments, but then, you know, once all that's said and done, um, proper hydration and good nutrition and making sure you're getting enough sleep, take care of, uh, take care of a lot of things. Absolutely. The fundamentals. <laughs> Oddly enough, you can't escape them. <laughs> all right. Two more. Uh, what's your favorite meal? Oh boy. Um, I, I, I'm a huge, uh, I, I like steak. Um, so I, I like a good, uh, um, I like a good steak, good porterhouse, good, uh, uh, good T-bone, uh, just depends on how hungry I am. Um, <laughs> so I, I'd say that's, that's an easy, uh, that's an easy choice, but I also like, uh, you know, uh, Mexican food, something a little bit spicier, uh, maybe leaning a little more in the Tex-Mex, uh, sort of direction, but, uh, hard to beat a steak. Yeah. That's my favorite too. Awesome. Um, okay. Final question. What is one book everyone should read? And it, and no, it doesn't need to be training related. So I would say, uh, boy, that could be a, a lengthy, lengthy list. Um, Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield, um, historical narrative about the 300, um, not the Frank Miller version, uh, <laughs> Great, great graphic novel and, and movie, but uh, this is this is a historical narrative based on on that. Um, that's really that's that's a really good book. My brother, who was going through Marine Corps OCS, uh, gave it to me, and um, it's uh, that's that's a, a, a very interesting uh, book. I also like all of Bill Bryson's stuff, um, educational, and you're guaranteed to laugh uh, a bit. And uh, so there's that. There you go. Cool. That's that's it. This is uh, this has been an absolute uh, honor and a blast. I I've learned a ton uh, over the uh, just under uh, two hours now. <laughs> um, so this has been uh, a real treat. Thank you so much. I know uh, how extremely busy uh, you are. So thank you for carving out some time in your schedule and uh, sharing your your uh, wisdom and experience uh, with uh, the audience. And uh, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. And uh... Keep plugging away. I will. Uh, just hang on the line. Let me give you a proper goodbye and we'll wrap it up. You got it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Leo Training Podcast. If you did, please head on over to iTunes, drop in a five-star review, or take a moment of your time and share it on your favorite social media network, such as Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.